Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for clicking on this and coming to hear the program that we've recorded. I'm Maureen Folk, and I'm the Outreach and Program Coordinator at the Chapman Museum. But in 2013, I was actually a volunteer excavator here at Weawaka. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about the archaeological excavations that occurred here, what was found, and what it all means. So let's get started. Before we get into the excavations, I wanna talk about the history of this property. To begin, we have to look at what was happening in America when this property saw its first permanent structure. This region of New York was part of a large wave of hotel resorts built at this time to aid in the booming tourism industry. This is part of what was coined the vacation habit. Vacation was meant to cure the ills of modern life like irritability, insomnia, anxiety, or indigestion. People began to understand that their health was tied to the changing modern world and that they were feeling the effects of the Industrial Revolution. This was an attempt to bring people back to nature and away from work. So in 2015, the vacation industry accounted for 7.6 million American jobs and generated a whopping 1.6 trillion in economic output but it started much differently. In the mid 1800s, sick leave didn't exist. So workers would lose pay and sometimes even their jobs for taking a day off. And women were hit the hardest by these working conditions because they suffered under the same hardships, but with significantly less pay. They were often sexually harassed by bosses and other employees, and they were subject to being fired if they dismissed those advances or became pregnant. So for women, taking a vacation seemed nearly impossible. Despite the lack of money to do so, vacation spots are quickly on the rise and women find themselves very interested in a break from these working conditions. So in 1913, the National Civic Foundation Vacation Fund was established and as many as 4,000 women used it to afford vacations in its first year. While this felt like progress, the women who were able to use it were almost exclusively white. And when they were offered additional financial support, it was given with the intention that they would mold themselves into more dutiful middle-class women, placing the belief on them that working-class women were less than. Now, vacationing is still on the rise. And in the 1920s, the automobile makes it a bit more accessible. Since working-class women still couldn't afford these vacations, they began to work at these vacation spots and became employees of the tourism industry. And this is where we start to see holiday houses growing in popularity. They provided affordable vacations for not just middle-class women, but working women too. So now that we know what was happening in the mid 1800s and on, let's talk about how this property played a role in that. The first permanent structure built here was the United States Hotel in 1853. When it was constructed, it had all the amenities you could want, like bill poles and bathtubs. Yes, a bathtub was a luxury amenity. The Fort William Henry Hotel was finished in 1855, and that quickly put the United States Hotel out of business. In 1855, Mrs. Lydia Palm Brayton and Miss Julia Smalley leased the United States Hotel for three years and opened the Lake George Young Ladies Institute. Now this sort of place taught young women how to be ladies. It improved their manners. It refined their scholarly pursuits like language and literature. And in an effort to be more self-sufficient, Mrs. Brayton's husband, John, purchased supplies and livestock to provide their own food. Now this is the first time we see farming on site for feeding guests and sending surplus to market. This is something that would continue on this property for years. So they were all set and ready to go, but only 30 pupils attended the first year. And this caused the Lake George Young Ladies Institute to close. In 1857, the hotel was sold at auction to a Mr. Francis G. Crosby. The details are a little muddled, but this is what we assume happened. From 1857 to 1902, this property is known as the Crosby Side Hotel. The Crosby family moved to Caldwell, which is what Lake George was known as at the time in 1840. At this point in time, Crosby is recorded in the census as a shoe manufacturer. 
And then later in 1870, the census lists him as keeping a boarding house. This seems to suggest that the Crosby Side Hotel wasn't necessarily flourishing, but they did have some permanent residence. Now in the 1870s, Crosby enlarges and improves the hotel, adding three guest cottages. Those are Rose, Pine, and Mayflower cottages. These improvements were so impactful that in the 1875 New York State Census, Crosby is finally listed as a hotel proprietor. By 1880, the Crosby side is valued at $75,000, which is nearly $2 million today. Later that year, the American Canoe Association organized there, and the hotel really flourishes at this time and gives the middle class a way to vacation affordably. So the building is the same as the United States Hotel, but the name changes to Crosby side and we see different furnishings and finishes. More and more people were making the trip to Lake George for vacation, and it was really an opportunity reserved for wealthy travelers until Crosby side. At its height, Alexander Graham Bell even stayed there for a professional meeting in 1891. Crosby managed to bring the hotel up to a higher value until he became a little less involved in it. In 1888, Crosby sold the hotel, but stayed on as the manager. In 1891, Crosby was replaced as the manager and he later died in 1895. As Lake George continues to grow in popularity for being part of this concept of sublime wilderness, we see an increase in service workers providing lodging and guides. Now, despite the loss of Crosby, the hotel does continue to host vacationing families and professional meetings. In the years that followed, the hotel was rebranded from a quiet, scenic getaway to this lively happening and modern hotel. They were trying to keep up with what else was happening in Lake George. Now, this was unsuccessful for Crosby Side, and over the course of the next six years, the hotel slowly declined until it closes in 1902. Many attribute the decline to the loss of Crosby first and then the death of one of the owners. In 1902, we see the property change hands once again. George Foster Peabody and Spencer Trask purchased the Crosby Side property with a plan to improve the hotel and open it in 1903 with the help of the Girls Friendly Society and priced low so that more people could afford a, a Lake George vacation. The Trasks were also the owners of Yado, an artist retreat in Saratoga Springs where Weawaka guests were taken on their visits. They reopened the property in 1903 as the Weawaka Holiday House and aimed to attract female vacationers from garment factories in Troy and Cohoes, with some as far as New York City. The Girls Friendly Society, or GFS, wanted to protect unmarried young women from the dangers of urban living, and that's why they opened the Weawaka Holiday House, as well as many other holiday houses. This is actually one of 30 holiday houses operating at the time in the United States by the Girls Friendly Society. Sometime in the first half of the 20th century, Weawaka actually detaches itself from the Girls Friendly Society with the help of Mary Fuller, and it became a summer vacation spot for all working girls instead of just factory women. They advertised affordable and healthful vacations for weary, overworked women and girls. In their first summer open, Weawaka hosted nearly 200 girls, charging a whopping $3.50 per week for room and board, which would be about $105 today. So still, still a pretty good deal. The girls were still expected to work when they were on vacation, but this was much more about continuing to build character. They were expected to serve tea or help in the garden or on the farm. Originally, the Weawaka Holiday House used a wing of the old Crosby Side Hotel, specifically the ballroom and the piano. But in 1905, the hotel and several outbuildings were destroyed by an arsonist, and somehow they still managed to open for the season. In the years that followed, the destroyed Pine Cottage was rebuilt and several new buildings were added. In 1908, Georgia O'Keeffe, at just 21 years old, came to Weawaka on an art scholarship. She was actually intimidated by the other artists and stopped painting for four years after that. Now, as we all know, 
she goes on to be a really exceptional artist. Weawaka was partially self-sustainable with large gardens and two milk cows, chickens, and pigs. There was a male groundskeeper who helped to take care of things and did general maintenance and repair to the property. Now, after steady improvements and additions over the decades, as well as continued support, Weawaka Holiday House was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1998, and in 2015, the name was changed to the Weawaka Center for Women. Now, before we move on to the excavations, I wanna cover what is a holiday house? This was a place where working women could take an affordable holiday. These houses popped up during the progressive era where women, minorities, and the working class were really pushing for better working conditions, child wel welfare, and mortality. They were seeking out time in nature where they could feel rejuvenated and get a break from all the fumes of the cities that they worked in. These all-female retreats are also a callback to the Victorian middle-class ideology of separate spheres. At the Holiday House, there were domestic spheres with family structure, such as mealtime, lights out time, scheduled activities, and absolutely no smoking, no alcohol consumption, or men. For Weawaka, this was meant to bind the women together as one, for mutual help or sympathy and to encourage dutifulness and faithfulness among other things. Now, while most women loved their stays, there were critics of this routine. A 1913 article said that there were too many restrictions placed on women and the system lacked freedom. But overall, this was a cheap way to get out of the city and into nature. So more often than not, women enjoyed their stays. This photo here is actually of some of the women on the porch of Rose Cottage. Now that we've covered the history of the property, we can dive into the archeological work that took place. In 2010, a longtime volunteer gardener found a porcelain room number in one of the beds. The shield shape mirrors the great seal of the United States of America, which was approved by Congress in 1782. This room number would have been part of the United States Hotel based on this information. This sparked an interest in knowing the various things that had taken place on this property over the years. My friend Megan Springate had visited Weawaka and offered to spearhead the archaeological investigation. So in archaeology, a good project starts with a question. What are we hoping to learn about this place? Megan wanted to look at what the experiences were like for working women here versus middle-class women. In addition, Crosby Side Hotel was mixed gendered and Weawaka was all female and still is all female. How do we see this reflected in the artifacts? These were the starting questions. Across several summers of excavations, five areas across the property were examined. Eight units were opened and 125 shovel test pits were dug. The focus was on ceramics, glass, and personal artifacts. Findings like coal, coal byproducts, mortar, concrete, foundation stone, plaster, and brick fragments were counted, weighed, and discarded. We also found things like clamshells, nails, flat iron from tin cans, body glass from vessels, window glass, and plastics. Now, in archaeology, it's your job to keep track of absolutely everything. This means you examine soil color, you take measurements, you draw maps, take photos, and write notes on observations. All of these things are used to piece together what everyday life looked like for women at Weawaka. The reason some of these things were discarded back into the soil is because once the information has been recorded, there's little reason to maintain the actual fragments of things like plaster or tin as part of the collection. So now that we have our questions, where do we begin to dig? Selecting locations to dig is based on a few things, your research questions, historical research, local knowledge, and survey. The first is relatively simple. If your research question is about how they used the shoreline, you're not going to be digging deep in the woods. Second, through historical research, you can learn how the land was previously used and use that information to determine likely spots for densi high densities of artifacts. Looking at maps and records can be really helpful in this stage. 
Third, local knowledge can be invaluable in archaeology. As an outsider coming into the area, archaeologists don't always know all of the bits and pieces of history. Locals who have lived in this region for decades may have found things or have stories and can tell you where a good spot to dig may be. And last, survey. There are two main ways to survey in archaeology, walking the site to see if there are artifacts on the surface, or digging a series of shovel test pits to see where there are high densities of artifacts beneath the surface. In a walking survey, people will space themselves out evenly and place flags or markers where they see artifacts either sitting on the surface or emerging from the ground. They do this at equally spaced inc increments so that they can set up a grid and cover a large area. Shovel test pits are smaller holes, about two lengths of a shovel on each side, that are dug in equal increments, again, of space, in order to determine the extent of a site and where there are high densities of artifacts. So for example, a line of, a line of these holes would be dug in increments of 10 meters apart on a grid. The grid tells us where the boundaries of the site are and where deposits are rich. I use this picture of the woods here because this is often what a site looks like at first glance. It's a spot in the woods that doesn't seem to have too much going on until you start really looking. I'm going to discuss the areas of excavations and the artifacts that were found, which lend insights to life at Weawaka over the years. First, area one. This area was lightly forested and at a quick glance, nothing really jumps out at you. On closer inspection, the ground was littered with white ceramics and glass. We later learned that these items belonged to the Crosby Side Hotel from the late 19th century. Two units were laid out, one by one meter squares, and 28 STPs covered this area. The units are used to get an idea of a bigger section of the site. An STP can be great, but a unit covers greater surface area, which is why we use them in archaeology. What we found in this area was a midden. Now a midden is essentially an area that would have been used for refuse. The source of the midden was originally unknown. Was it used by the United States Hotel, the Crosby side, or Weawaka? After finding a piece of blue feather edge creamware, the midden could be dated to approximately 1870 to 1902 which means it was made during the time of the Crosby Side Hotel. This type of creamware was only made for a specific period of time, which is why we're able to date the middens so precisely. There was also a bottle from United Vintners labeled in Imperial One Quart, which was introduced during the 1960s and 70s, so much later than the rest of the deposit. And what this tells us is that the midden was likely moved in the 1960s or 70s. Perhaps this was during the construction of Lake House on the property. We also found lamp chimneys, buttons, jewelry, a religious medal, and a children's toy. Middens are messy to excavate through because this is essentially a garbage dump. But it's turn of the century garbage here, so it's mostly ceramics and glass. And as you can see in this picture, there's lots of artifacts here. And one of the most important things in archeology span is not just yank things straight out of the ground. We have to excavate until we find the bottom of an item and then it can be removed. For example, my unit partner and I excavated for a week before we were finally able to pull these cooking pots from the unit. And it was a very exciting moment to finally have them removed. Sometimes in archeology, span the weather doesn't cooperate. On rainy days, we would use the former ice house on the property to set up a lab to process artifacts. This meant we washed the various pieces that could be washed in water, cataloged what we found, labeled bags with numbers, and gave whole intact artifacts their own label. In order for artifacts to be properly measured and analyzed, they, they need to be clean. So even though this was a rainy day activity, it's a really important one. And the process of washing is quite simple. Artifacts from the same bag are put into a strainer of some kind, dipped into the water, swished around a bit, and then each piece is individually cleaned with a toothbrush and water. Then the artifacts are placed in a safe spot to dry with all of the information associated with where they were found attached to them. 
In archaeology, if you lose the context of where something has come from, you lose a lot of the meaning. So ensuring that they are always with their contextual information is super important. The next space that I helped to excavate was area two. This area is southeast of Lake House and historic documentation tells us that it was the location of the Crosby Side Hotel. The artifacts on the surface date to the early 20th century and there is a noticeable, noticeable depression in the landscape. In archeology, span we aren't solely focusing on the artifacts. The landscape and location can tell us so much about the site as well. A soil probe was used and it showed us that there was a really dense concentration of artifacts in this spot. So 25 STPs were dug to determine how far reaching the assemblage was and two units were excavated to try and capture what we were working in. One of those units was put on the inside and outside of the depression and we found a brick wall running through it. Looking at this wall and the contents within it, we determined that this spot was a brick lined privy. Before you get grossed out, let me explain a little. A privy is an outhouse, but it also would have been cleaned out on a regular basis to keep up with odor and the buildup of waste. Now, based on the stratigraphy of the soils, remembering that soil is a really important part of archeology, span the privy would have been cleaned out around 1905. And we know this because this clean out removed evidence of the fire. Throughout history, people have this deep seated need to fill these empty holes in the ground. So when the privy was empty, it was filled with refuse and used more like a midden. Upon further investigation, it was determined that this 26 by 14 foot privy was built to support the 200 guest capacity of the Crosby Side Hotel. The Fort William Henry Hotel had a 900 guest capacity. So just imagine what that privy looked like. Can you see this straight line cutting across the unit here? I'll highlight it with a red box. This was a brick wall that went directly through this unit. Most of the artifacts found within the privy were glass, ceramics, building material, fuel or fuel byproducts like coal and slag associated with the early years of Weawaka. We also found light bulbs, buttons, pieces of clothing, cosmetic bottles and jars, and food or beverage bottles. The next area we excavated was area three. Now this spot was unique because it was the only area of the property that had been consistently occupied by a male. And that's a big reason why this spot was chosen. We can examine the artifacts in area three and see what the differences are between the female and male experience here at Weawaka. 20 STPs were dug here and a unit was opened in a spot that had a high concentration of artifacts. The artifacts found dated to the early decades of the 20th century. We found wire nails, charred wood, an insulator, a knob and tube wiring. The wiring was probably from when electricity was run to the house. In this spot, we also began to find melted objects. Here's where we finally uncover evidence of the 1905 fire. This list of artifacts is a lot different. These are all maintenance objects and very much demonstrate that a male groundskeeper lived here. Area four was on the main lawn area where special events take place. 41 STPs were dug, but no full-size units were open. The spot is situated between Lake House and Rose Cottage, and it would have been a space for recreation. In the soil, we do see evidence of the 1905 fire in the form of some ash. A cast iron quoit was found, which would have been used in a lawn game similar to horseshoes. We also found some building hardware, which was possibly associated with the original Pine Cottage. Now, the reason units weren't opened here is because the deposits just weren't very rich. It was a smattering of artifacts that didn't tell us much more than what we already knew. Last, we have area five. This was the Southwestern yard. And similarly to area four, no excavation units were opened here either. This area was explored via 13 STPs. This space was the rear yard of Fuller House. And we were searching for items associated with the labor of leisure. What we found were objects from the 1903 to 1905 transition from the Crosby Side Hotel to Weawaka. In addition, there were some pieces of chert debitage, which we found. 
Now this is exciting because it informs us about the even deeper history of this property, which was the use of it by indigenous people. Because the archeology span here was focused on the historic use of the house and not the people who occupied it before colonization, these artifacts were cataloged and saved, but not analyzed in depth. In addition to the excavation of these different areas, on July 20th, 2013, a few volunteers snorkeled along the Weawaka shore to see if remains from the 1905 fire had been pushed into the water. 12 artifacts or artifact clusters were found off of the shore and they were recorded at depths of three to eight feet. Based on further examination, they seem to be associated with the original Pine Cottage burning down and not the Crosby Sight Hotel. Information about the artifacts was recorded, but the artifacts themselves were left in the water. This is not an odd practice in archeology, span especially underwater archeology. span You'll learn more about this if you come to my talk in August, but for now, I'll just say these artifacts were not critical to the understanding of this archaeological site, and so it was not necessary for us to remove them from the water. So now that we've talked a little bit about excavations, let's dive into what we found and what it means. The nature of America was changing at this time. We see women taking more advantage of public leisure activities, social reform organizations are increasing, and organized education is on the rise. Weawaka wanted to provide women with an affordable vacation in the wilderness. Now we're going to look at the Crosby side assemblage and compare it with the Weawaka assemblage to see the differences in vacationing. For the Crosby side hotel, we found evidence that they were laundering on site through various Bengal bluing bottles, which would have been used to keep linens bright and clean until bleach cornered the market in the mid late mid to late 1900s. Most of the ceramics were plain and mass produced. These were specifically designed to survive heavy use and they were inexpensive to replace when they broke. And because they were plain, you didn't have to worry about finding matching patterns when they needed replacing. There were two different brands present of these white ceramics. And that tells us that at some point, the hotel switched from a UK supplier to one from New Jersey. And they did this to cut down on costs. The different vessel sizes tell us that the staff may have eaten family style while guests would have been served. In deposits associated with the Crosby side, we see evidence of wine and liquor, as well as carbonated soft drinks, including a Bibby and Ferguson bottle from a Glens Falls company. We also found several rounded bottom bottles. These were designed to keep corks wet and bottles sealed while the thick walls withstood the carbonation. Now remember, the Crosby Side Hotel catered to the middle class. In the archeological material, there are a lot of soda bottles found, which at the time falls in line with the middle class ideology of practicing temperance or moderation when it came to alcohol. This demonstrated that they had self-discipline. Before sanitation systems were mainstream, alcohol was consumed at every meal because it was safer to drink than the water. As this practice gave rise to alcoholism, Sobriety slowly became a, a marker of morality and high social status. So these carbonated soda bottles in the Crosby side assemblage tell us that the people vacationing here were putting out the impression that they were of a higher class and not the middle class that they actually were. There were several other interesting finds in the deposit associated with the Crosby side. A religious medal was also found at the site, which ties the person who lost it to the practice of Catholicism, as well as some black beads that may have come off of a rosary that a devout man or woman would carry. The beads also could simply have just come off of a piece of jewelry, showing that women were still wearing their jewelry on vacation. There was also a small alloy ring that likely belonged to a child and fragments of corsets that may have been worn by men or women. Men actually wore corsets in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, but men's corsets were advertised in a Sears catalog as late as 1987. We also found garter clips and a male collar button. These items would have been part of people's everyday dress and tell us what was worn while they were vacationing at Crosby side. 
In addition to these artifacts, a bottle of Murray and Landman's Florida water was recovered from the site. This would have been used to cool a fever, relieve headaches, or to soothe and relieve illness. It could have easily been added to bath water and would have been an excellent thing to travel with. This bottle here isn't one that we found at Weawaka, but it's a great example. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about the deposits associated with Weawaka. In the Crosby side deposits, we did not find evidence of cosmetics used by women. Cosmetic use picks up as we see a shift from industrial capitalism to consumer capitalism. There's a distinct onset of beauty culture where women begin a performance of femininity. In the Weawaka deposits, a single jar of Pond's cream was recovered. And on top of that, half of the product was still inside. Pond's is actually still made today. These creams were quite popular and they were marketed to help improve skin. In addition, multiple Heinz honey and almond cream bottles were found in Weawaka deposits, which come from Portland, Maine. We also recovered one Frostilla lotion bottle from Elmira, New York. Heinz and Frostilla marketed that they would make the hands smooth and soothe the effects from wind or sun. These two brands also advertised a new aftershave for men that stopped the sting, healed cuts, and soothed the skin. As people begin to invest more in the cosmetic industry, we see them begin to purchase things to mask body odor as well. These products were called toilet water or perfumes. A cashmere bouquet bottle of toilet water dates to 1917 or the mid to late 1920s. There was also a bottle of Odorono, and this was an antiperspirant that actually did two things. It quite literally manufactured the issue of body odor, and then it solved it. Yes, the human body can have distinct odors, but our body also has its own ways of correcting this issue. Odorono told people that the only way to solve the smell was their antiperspirant. This was the very first company to even use the term BO. And from 1920 to 1927, their sales went from 65,000 to a million dollars, which is $15 million today. Women initially thought it was unnecessary to buy this product until they ran an ad stating that to keep a man and your place in society, you better not smell. So from the turn of the 20th century, makeup and cosmetics became important aspects of everyday image. Having to apply cosmetic products in private, women bonded over this experience, building community, camaraderie, and friendship. In addition to the cosmetics we did find, the ones we didn't told us something too. There were no rouge pots, eyebrow pencils, lipsticks, or mascara containers, even though these items were very popular at the time. Now, this could be because women wanted to maintain conservative habits that were deemed respectable, and heavy makeup at this time was not associated with high society women. Weawaka also maintained a rather strict moral ideology, so it's not surprising that these women may have opted for a more conservative beauty routine. While their beauty routine may have been traditional, women at Weawaka still knew how to let their hair down, literally. In public, long hair was styled and kept in updos as part of an appropriate social presentation. Being away from men at Weawaka, women literally let their hair down. Hazel Vandenberg is one such woman. This photo is from 1925. And in addition to letting her hair down, women were boycotting corsets at Weawaka. While a couple were found, there is a general lack of corsets in photos and archeologically. This shows that the women here were relaxing and not keeping up with the social norms outside of vacationing. This made lawn games and hiking easier. Outside of Weawaka, corsets at the time were used to express femininity, as well as an indicator of good health or manners. Women who publicly objected corsets were also seen as using vulgar slang, they crossed their legs, they smoked in public. These were all seen as scandalous at the time. Several medicinal bottles were also found at the site, like cod liver oil, Phillips milk of magnesia, solution of citrate magnesia, bromo seltzer, 
a new whole bottle, two citrate of magnesia bottles, and a small bottle of Bayer aspirin. All of these, except for cod liver oil and aspirin, were actually used to relieve gastrointestinal distress. These would have been used if the food was bothering them or to maintain a thin figure. Citrate magnesia is actually still used to clear the system before certain medical procedures, but I'm not going to elaborate on that any further. Weawaka was pretty self-sufficient. It was supported by two milk cows in a thriving garden, but a lot of their food also came from tin cans. And we know this because we found tons of them. Cans would have held fruits, vegetables, meats, fish, or evaporated milk. The canned items may have led to poor digestion and thus the use of those digestive aids that we just talked about. To open these cans, they would have used a key at the top. This picture shows several of these tin keys. In terms of ceramics, Weawaka had regular tableware, but they also had girls friendly society wares and Weawaka plates. Sometime after 1903, Weawaka distanced themselves from the Girls Friendly Society so that the site could truly be open to all women. Based on the evidence, we think that this happened around 1920. In 1957, we see a shift in ceramics to generic hotel wares, and this would have been done to keep costs down. Custom dishes get expensive. In 1961, they did introduce the custom hotel wares with the Weawaka transfer print, and these are actually still in use here today. In terms of serving dishes, these were either generic white or some had a blue willow design. Between finding these serving vessels and then finding sterno cans, we begin to get an idea of how meals were served. Sterno cans would have kept the food warm for a buffet line. So in the 1910s and 20s, we know that women may have served themselves buffet style. On the flip side, some of the dish sets were blue or black transfer print, and these styles suggest that they also could have been serving Old English style, where things would have been in the center of the table, and once again, you serve yourself. Even though Weawaka maintained a strict policy of no alcohol, five bottles were found throughout excavations that demonstrate that some of these women were a little more rebellious. The fact that there were alcohol bottles found does not necessarily mean that the women were resistant to Weawaka's rules. They may have instead been expressing their resistance to the idea of middle-class respectability. They didn't want to just be cookie cutter women who followed every rule and regulation placed on them by society. Four of these bottles were Bellin Brothers and one was Evans Ale. With shipping happening via the railroad, these bottles would have found themselves in Lake George at various hotels. If the women were interested, they were just a short boat ride away from some of these hotels, and thus they had access to alcohol. Given that the onset of prohibition was in 1920, these bottles were likely deposited in the 1910s. There is hardly any archeology span conducted on hotels and lodging from the 19th and 20th centuries. But what we see at Weawaka is a glance at how women vacationed and relaxed while they were in this world completely run by their male counterparts. We see that women maintained interests in beauty, continuing to use creams and cosmetics, but they also wanted to address issues such as the pay gap, structural violence, and privilege that was rampant in the workforce. They let their hair down and they left their corsets at home. There's been very little archaeology done on hotels and lodging, especially from the turn of the century. This dig represents the first excavation at a women's holiday house. Today, Weawaka is the longest continuously operating women's retreat in the United States, and the archaeology tells the stories of the many women who have stayed there. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Megan Springgate for allowing me the privilege of being part of such a cool project and to Doreen Kelly for hosting us at Weawaka. Thank you.